single pilot airliners where only one pilot would be left in the cockpit and the remaining pilot would be replaced by automation is a really hot topic right now. So let's see what it's all about, shall we? To start with, having only one pilot in the cockpit of passenger aircraft is not a very popular idea, at least if you ask the main stakeholders, which are really passengers and us, the pilots. But interestingly, this still seems to be something that other stakeholders do want and are actively working towards, and we've seen that a lot in the media lately. So let's look at what this actually means and what the benefits and problems are and if it's even possible. It is really not that long ago since many airliners actually had three people in the cockpit. A captain, a first officer and a flight engineer. And before that, some aircraft even have four or even five crew members, including navigators and radio operators. Some Russian aircraft actually still do. But as time moved forward, newer aircraft had these roles and responsibilities integrated into the pilot's role. This was made possible thanks to technological leaps in computing and ergonomics, which helped the two pilots to actually perform those duties safely. So if you look at it from that perspective, from a purely evolutionary standpoint, going from two pilots to one might seem like the next natural step to take. But is it though? Obviously, many smaller private aircraft and even some private jets have always flown with just one pilot because of their relatively simple operation. But now, it looks like some stakeholders are looking to expand that list to include bigger and more advanced passenger aircraft as well. The big aircraft manufacturers are doing a lot of research at the moment into ways to make single pilot airline operations possible. For years, Airbus has worked on a program called ATOOL, which stands for Autonomous Taxi Takeoff and Landing, using an Airbus A350 as a test bench. This concept relies on additional clever sensors, databases and computers that allow the aircraft to perform many more functions autonomously, greatly easing the workload of the pilot, or, well, in this case, the one pilot, I guess. These aircraft will, for example, be able to use cameras to identify their position on approach without having to fully rely on ILS signals or even GPS. That's similar to what we human pilots do when we start seeing terrain and revert from instruments to visual flying. Now, this is very cool technology, but in my view, it serves its purpose best as a further pilot tool than an actual replacement. Boeing hasn't announced any similar projects with its own airliners, but as it turns out, the American manufacturer is approaching the same idea from a different angle, via EV tools. Now, I won't go into the plethora of all electric air taxis and other similar vehicles here, but Boeing has taken a lot of interest and has even invested in a company called Whisk, who does all of that. And it appears that a big factor in Boeing's investment is the fact that Whisk's EV tool designs don't include a pilot on board. Now, figuring out how to design these pilotless systems and working with aviation authorities on the necessary standards to certify them could give a serious edge to whoever does it first, and it might be why Boeing is involved here. Last January, they extended their investment in Whisk by $450 million. Meanwhile, both Airbus and Boeing are clever enough to know that passengers aren't very keen on the idea of having none or just one pilot in the cockpit. So the first aircraft to operate this way will most likely be freighters. The work that Airbus was doing for the ATOL program came shortly before they officially announced the A350F, the freighter variant of their newest widebody aircraft. And a few months after that, Boeing announced a freighter variant of their 777X program, which they will call the 777-8F. The 777X is introducing more advanced avionics and the freighter variant could therefore be the most likely candidate for such a possible later upgrade. But if pilots don't want this, and we don't, and passengers definitely don't want it, then why is it even being discussed? Well, I'll tell you all about that after this short message from my sponsor. Going abroad is great, until you realize how differently the internet operates in other countries. That's why I use today's sponsor, NordVPN, which allows me to browse the internet of my home country as if I'd never left. After all, your IP address influences search engine results, default languages, shopping tools and much, much more. For example, by using a VPN, you can avoid getting into trouble with your local bank and even sometimes accessing local services cheaper. Perhaps you are a US citizen living in Spain and you still want to stay connected to the US online community. Um, Watch the same streaming content as your friends do. Well, with the click of a button, you've got your local news, tailored search results and home versions of websites at your fingertips. Plus, it helps shield your data from snooping eyes. 
NordVPN offers you more than 5,000 ultra-fast service in 59 different countries. So start browsing your internet freely and safely today. And right now, if you go to nordvpn.com slash mentor now, you'll get an awesome exclusive deal. And you don't have anything to lose because Nord will always give you a 30-day money-back guarantee. Now back to the video. Today, it is of course possible for a single pilot to control and land an airliner if it becomes necessary, for example, after a pilot incapacitation. That would be treated as an emergency, but not because a pilot would in any way struggle to do it. No, it's considered an emergency because the aircraft has been reduced down to one critical system. And if something would happen to that remaining pilot, it would be a very bad day. But what we are discussing now is a very different scenario, one where single pilot flying is a routine event. And beyond Airbus' previous work and Boeing's possible future plans, aviation authorities around the world are now apparently looking at how they would go about certifying this type of operation. Now to be clear, these initial moves are not about completely removing one pilot from the cockpit, at least not to start with. The first goal is to reduce the number of crew members necessary for long-haul flights. When airline fly would augment the crews, like with a third or even a fourth pilot, depending on the length of the flight and other conditions. The new idea is to have two pilots in the cockpit, as we do today, during takeoff and climb, but only until the aircraft reaches cruising altitude. Then one of these two pilots could go to an onboard crew rest area for a while, leaving the other pilot alone in the cockpit. Later on, the two pilots would then switch roles so the other one can have a rest as well. And then returning with ample time before descent, both pilots would be in their seats during the descent and approach into the destination. This means that the aircraft would still have two pilots for all critical phases of flight, but rely on just one plus some additional automation for these cruise portions of the flight. Now, in the past few weeks, the European Aviation Safety Agency, EASA, has started a process to examine the necessary requirements for certifying aircraft for this type of operation. They're going to call it Extended Minimum Crew Operation, or EMCO. But the ASA is also looking for requirements for Single Pilot Operations, or SIPO, to possibly be implemented at a later stage if and when EMCO is successful. ICAO, the UN civil aviation organization, is apparently also considering whether or not to go ahead with its own assessment of the same ideas. No formal decisions have been made as far as we are aware anyway, but from its side, EASA has identified a number of areas where they think that the single pilot phase of flight represents new risks. In order to remove the redundancy of one pilot, manufacturers will have to convince authorities that the aircraft systems will be able to identify pilot errors because the lack of a second crew member means that there will be no cross-checking or challenge and response between the pilots. These systems will have to be able to identify when a pilot is fatigued and also crucially, they must also be able to tell when or if the lone pilot actually becomes incapacitated. And if that would happen, the aircraft manufacturers would have to show that the aircraft would remain completely safe for its passengers and crew as well as being able to interact with other traffic and air traffic control. This is where the systems have to prove capable of moving from automation to autonomy. Now you might ask, If the pilot would become incapacitated and the other is sleeping, can't the system simply just ring a bell in the rest area to wake up the second pilot? Well, it's safe to assume that the plane will indeed do that, but it's not quite enough. Many accidents evolve from cascading failures that happens in a matter of seconds. And there's nothing that guarantees that whatever caused the acting pilot to become incapacitated didn't also affect the other one, like a sudden explosive decompression for example. Also, bear in mind that there is something called sleep inertia that will affect the returning pilot. You probably already know what sleep inertia is. It's if someone wakes you up suddenly and unexpectedly, you know, your your brain needs a few minutes to get switched back on, you know, to give you back your bearings and decision-making capabilities. This typically takes between 15 and 20 minutes to fully get rid of, and that's time that that second pilot might not have. So the automatics would have to be ready for that. Finally, there are more issues, even when the single pilot is fully healthy and all aircraft systems are just fine. For example, what happens when the single pilot needs to go to the toilet? Where will the pilot's toilet be in these aircraft? And presumably, the aircraft will have to be fully autonomous during the time that the uh, pilot sits on the throne, no? So what this really means is that if an aircraft with one pilot is to be considered safe, it must remain safe even if it has to fly with no pilot in the cockpit at all. 
A system cannot be built with known safety weaknesses. That's a fundamental principle in modern aviation and the reason why all safety critical systems must be backed up by redundancy. This means that in order for full single pilot operation to be viable, the autonomy of the aircraft must be so advanced that it rivals the capacity of the human mind, which basically means self-awareness or true artificial intelligence. And we are far away from that type of technology still. But both Airbus and Boeing are still apparently considering this, so at least some operators must want it. And if that's so, why would they want it? Well, you might think that the answer to that is simple. Cost. But it turns out that there's nothing simple about cost in this context. Yes, airlines would save some money from having one less crew member to pay for. Initially, that would only apply for long-haul flights where an extra crew member could be removed. But you have to then look at what this extra pilot actually cost the airlines in the right context in order to see if it's actually a saving or not. Having another first officer in the cockpit of a long-haul cargo aircraft might cost the airline, let's say, around $150,000 per year. Granted, that's a lot of money, but to the airline, it's comparable to what some maintenance tasks cost for an aircraft engine. And more to the point, cargo operators who, remember, are supposedly the first ones that these single pilot operations are being prepared for, have another very important cost that they have to deal with. And that is whether or not they're going to buy or lease factory freighters or converted freighters. As we've covered already, making jets capable of flying routinely with a single pilot, even if it's just in cruise, will require advanced avionics and protections, and most likely a new internal layout in order to ease toilet visits and so on. In other words, this type of operation will likely require the purchase of brand new jets. But the thing is that not every cargo company out there normally buys brand new freighters. Big companies like FedEx, UPS or DHL might actually do that, but much of the world's dedicated cargo capacity comes from smaller cargo companies who rely primarily on passenger to freighter conversions. Even FedEx, UPS and the other big names rely at least in part on those type of older jets. So then, in order to save money on a plane that doesn't need a third relief pilot, these companies will have to switch from conversions over to buying brand new jets. And in terms of cost savings, that doesn't make much sense. Even after generous volume discounts, a factory Boeing 767 freighter, for example, could cost three or four times as much as a converted 767 freighter, if not more even. So if the difference between a new freighter and a converted one is around $80 million, would the company really consider switching to new jets just to save money on pilot salaries and hotel bills? Doesn't sound very logical, does it? But sure, the airlines who do buy new factory-built freighters will likely be interested in this technology. There's no way around that. So if that's not the driver, then what is? Well, I recently made a video about the 1500-hour rule in the United States that you can watch here. In it, I explained how this rule not only doesn't serve the purpose it was designed for, but it also creates an artificial block in the supply of qualified pilots. In reality, it's likely that the prospect of a long-term pilot shortage that drives much or most of the demand for single pilot or extended minimum crew operations, not actual airline costs. As the pool of available qualified pilots shrinks, the airlines would be looking for ways to safeguard their operations and might look to technology like this in order to help solve the problem. So in my view, this is clearly another reason why our industry needs to work harder to meet this demand with talented, well-trained and qualified pilots going forward. So what do I think about this then? Well, if it hasn't been obvious up until now, I think that this is fundamentally a bad idea and a dangerous road to be walking down. The design of modern airliners are built around the principles of generous redundancy with two engines plus the APU, three generators, three hydraulic systems and two or three of everything else that is of any importance. So it doesn't really make sense to have just one person up in the front to control all of these things, does it? And when we're talking about the multi-crew principle, we aren't just talking about redundancy in the number of people controlling the aircraft. No, the real magic lies in how those two pilots cross-check actions and catch each other's potential mistakes. Removing one pilot means that we will lose this final level of scrutiny. And I can tell from my own experience that one pilot can make a lot of small mistakes, but a complete two-pilot crew makes very few. 
Decades of experience in crew resource management, ergonomics and standard operating procedures are built on these principles with incremental improvements who have happened over time. These improvements have often come off the lessons that follow from tragic accidents. More automated or autonomous systems will need to match this level of safety immediately and that likely won't happen. Instead, we will have new emergencies that no one had thought about but without the flexibility of two trained pilots to deal with it. Yes, it may be theoretically possible to have a remote pilot on the ground assisting the uh, remaining pilot, but making such data links robust enough to be secure from malicious attacks seems highly improbable, and the prospect of having someone hijack an aircraft remotely is truly the stuff of nightmares. I personally do think that there will be legislation approving the reduction in augmented crew for long-haul operations in the semi-near future. But that's where I think it will stop for at least the next few decades. I don't think that we will see true single pilot airliners until at least after my career is over and possibly beyond the next generation of pilots as well. Lastly, we also have to ask the question, if and when these one-man airliners appear, who will actually be sitting up there alone in the cockpit to fly them? It's not going to be me, that's for sure. Now, check out this video next, which I think you're really going to enjoy or binge on this playlist. If you want to support the work that I do here on the channel, then consider becoming part of my awesome Patreon crew and join my next weekly hangout. It's really, really great. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.